to try to take Tales from Gimli Hospital on its own. It's an impossible film to, to make sense of. It was a mind-blowing experience to see a Guy Madden film for the first time and to not really know anything about his style. Guy's work was a kind of that peculiar feeling where you're not really sure what you've seen, but you, you know it was good. Guy has taken this story of his people, the Icelandic people of Manitoba, and this horrible tragedy that happened when 80% of them died, and he's, he's kind of made a comedy out of it. I don't think people really seen anything like that before. From that standpoint, I think it was a very, very special film. Tales from the Gimli Hospital. A deadly pestilence rages through an idyllic northern Manitoba town sometime in the late 19th century. Caught up in the plague are delirious Einar and his hospital mate, Gunnar, who discover they have something in common, sexual relations with Gunnar's late wife. Madden's experimental deadpan tone poem traps viewers in a loop of stories within stories. The film encompasses everything from homoeroticism, necrophilia, to a black-faced minstrel. Despite numerous obstacles, Madden was able to make a small independent movie in Winnipeg and watched it grow into a cult midnight movie success, even though the film was rejected by the Toronto International Film Festival. The film was born out of a love for silent and part-talky cinema and a desire to replicate the success of fellow Winnipeg film group member John Pays. Made on a minuscule budget and with an amateur crew, it showcased the unique vision of one of the world's most critically acclaimed directors and influenced a generation of Canadian filmmakers who proceeded to express their independent visions on screen. At that time, obviously Winnipeg wasn't the center of the universe for film and it wasn't the center of the film universe for Canada. It was really nowhere, absolutely, you know, and the one thing that that we did have was the Winnipeg Film Group. A group of filmmakers got together, called themselves the Winnipeg Film Group, and they initially started to show films. So, you know, this is back in the days before DVD, before VHS even. Uh, these people were watching 60 mil prints with projectors screened on walls. It started from just wanting to see work, wanting to see good independent Canadian film. And then it was a co-op and they started to make films and the rest, you know, just was history. John Pays was, was kind of like the uber filmmaker of the Winnipeg Film Group at that time, and Guy was almost like his, um, you know, the mentee. In 1985, Pays directed and starred in his first feature, the Campy Prairie postmodern Crime Wave. The film was an incredibly important film because I think it proved that the important thing in making an independent film was to be resourceful and imaginative and not necessarily to have a lot of money. Here's a guy who went out and bought a Bolex, bought a light, read a book, had his ideas, looked at films very carefully and studied the lighting for hours by himself and just took $100 and started shooting a film. The film got incredible attention from critics. Guy had spent actually a lot of time on the sets of a lot of John Pays' early films. They were friends, but they were also hugely competitive and not just in film but uh, personal lives. You know, Guy saw what Pays was doing and said, I want to do that. I mean, because I think he had come out of the U of M with an economics degree or something like that. Well, I went from being a, a calculus and science major to someone who liked just sort of wandering around in the mystery of books and painting and photography. Men began to hang around with University of Manitoba film professors Stephen Snyder and George Tolles who schooled him in the silent era and Hollywood melodramas. I think there was a really interesting teacher-student relationship going on there, you know, where, you know, it wasn't just confined to the classroom, but it actually also happened in the professor's sort of living rooms and, you know, it was sort of all-night film festivals. 
the university gave me a projector. So I would just bring the movies home and every Friday and or Saturday night, I would run them. I watched a lot of movies endlessly with um, my friends Ian and John Harvey on Steve Snyder's wall, a big cracked plaster wall. Since Guy lived across the alley, he must have watched 200 films <laughs> like that. I was really excited to discover that you didn't need to be a very uh, technically skilled filmmaker to make uh, powerfully effective films. In 1985, Madden made his first short film, The Dead Father. When his depressed cinematographer refused to get out of bed on the first day of shooting, Madden learned how to use a Bolex camera and shot the film himself. The film was a minor triumph and earned Madden an invitation to the Toronto Film Festival. I decided to make another movie. I decided to make something about Gimli, this really peculiar Icelandic fishing village on the shore of Lake Winnipeg. Because I grew up in, um, in the Icelandic community in Winnipeg, everyone in, in the house except the men, my father and my brothers, spoke Icelandic. Icelanders can't be quiet about their heritage. When they were forced to leave Iceland in 1874 because of droughts and plagues and volcanic eruptions, they had picked up smallpox in a quarantine in Kingston, Ontario, promptly started dying from it. Winter hit immediately and they started freezing to death. The privations just started mounting so high, it became kind of blackly funny. It just seemed that there was enough sort of gloomy lore surrounding um, Gimli's origins that um, it seemed worth recording on film somehow. In collaboration with his friend, Ian Hanford, Madden jotted down some ideas on a set of post-it notes. These scraps of paper became the shooting script for a film that eventually grew into Tales from the Gimli Hospital. For the entire 18 months of production, the, the project was called Gimli Saga because um, the whole tone of the story uh, was based on, on the readings that Ian Hanford and I uh, made from the book by the same title, Gimli Saga, written by a bunch of citizens, members of a Rotary Guild or something here in Gimli in 1975. It's a, basically a collection of oral histories of, uh, of Gimli. And it's really charming. I think actually everyone has probably seen a book like it because every single town in Canada has a book like it. Maybe not quite as thick as that. Little details from Gimli Saga are always popping up in, in the script, literally, but it, the spirit of Gimli Saga was always in it. I think the script was just this little 12, 13 page document that had a few snippets of dialogue. The script was very rudimentary. I had read Dostoevsky's Eternal Husband, and I liked the basic love triangle there. Two men and a dead woman. I'd been in a relationship with a woman. I had a friend who was, had been in a uh, relationship with the same woman. She was now an ex-girlfriend to both of us, but she still sort of lived on as a factor in, in the equation between the two men. The Einar Gunnar male relationship had a definite pays Madden component. I certainly understood Guy wanting to dramatize jealousy and obsession. Emboldened by that structure and, and its um, similarities to my own experience, I thought I would just make a movie involving two men and a dead woman. <laughs> I didn't even know where to find actors, and Pays was digging them up from somewhere, so I was just digging them up from Pays' sets. <laughs> Kyle McCullough I knew a little bit from his work in some John Pays movies, Oak Ivy and other Dead Elms. I think when he was 18, he had a nifty little part in that. It was fun. And um, for some reason, I just thought 
I want to I want to use him. He seemed to have a, a ready-made old movie quality to him that you can't manufacture. I had gone to Vancouver and then hitchhiked down the west coast to Mexico and then hitchhiked back to Winnipeg. And he asked me, you know, would you play this part of Einar? And I said, yeah, sure, you know, I'll do that. I got nothing else to do. Angela Heck I didn't really know, but had been in a few plays with her and stuff like that at the time and um, had used her very briefly in The Dead Father without really getting to know her. I just remember seeing her selling chocolate bars at a candy counter for a long time, and I was always looking for kind of anachronistic looking people, and thought it might be fun just to take this anachronistic little blonde girl and put her in one of my films. It took me the longest time to script the courage to ask her, you know, how do you go up to someone selling chocolate bars and ask them to be in your movie? I think it was George Tolles had come up to me at the theater and said, uh, do you want to be in a film? Show up at this address at this and this time on a Saturday afternoon, and there you go. I was always getting other people to ask people to be in movies. It's kind of creepy. I was initially supposed to be in the film. I was supposed to, you know, have Michael Godley's role. Because he's portly and Kyle was skinny, uh, they would make a, a nice visual contrast. And then Greg dropped out because he wanted to go to law school. There was this very brief period where I was like trying to be like responsible or something. And uh, I don't know, my girlfriend was saying, uh, why are you wasting your time and doing stuff like that? You should be like trying to get a real job or something. And uh, so I listened to her. Then I guess I was just starting to think along the lines of bigger, bigger guys. So there was this guy, Mike Godley, who I enjoyed tremendously in Black Hole Theater Productions. I just asked him and he was tickled to accept. Well, Godley was a stand-up comedian, first and foremost, you know, and, and he, but he just had that jowly look that that guy loved. I mean, when you look at some of these early German Expressionist films, you know, there's just like great character faces in it, and I think that's why he loved, loved Godley. I put an ad in the paper and got a great deal of response for all the extras. I just wanted to get as many interesting faces as possible. It was during my photo test that I took on these people that I noticed that if you put makeup on, on um, 13 year old girls, they looked 25 or 30 years old. I decided, along with Kyle, that we would cast nothing but pre-adolescent girls in makeup to pass as adults. It was just kind of our secret to ourselves. And then I needed a studio. His mother and his aunt Lil had run a beauty salon underneath the family home on Ellis Avenue, and that space was vacant. The set was in a building which my Aunt Lil built with her own two hairdressing hands. I adored that place, and yet when I suddenly needed uh, a studio, I wasted no time in demolishing uh, everything that was dear to me in that place to make the set for Gimli Hospital. I built it in one day, and I was just hammering spikes into the wall and chipping off plaster that my aunt had been working in front of for 50 years. It didn't sadden me at all at the time. It saddens me a lot now, and I'm haunted by it very frequently in, in dreams. And um, I even find myself driving past the tailor shop that it's now become frequently, just praying that it's still standing, that it hasn't been burnt down or torn down by somebody. I asked my Aunt Lil what her earliest memory was, and she said it was a fire on the roof of her uh, uh, f farmhouse uh, when she was sick and probably age two or so and the farm hands put it out with pails of milk and it leaked through the ceiling and dripped onto her. And, uh, so I found a way of including that early on. I was able to both pay tribute to her and find something that actually um, seemed to make sense to me in the context of the movie. She was just breathing her last as shooting started, and I was able to get her in one shot of the movie, um, just playing a um, bedside vigil sitter with my mother playing a patient. When she died, she actually left me um, about $40,000, um, which I used to um, make the movie and live. I kind of rationalized it as um, not money 
not an inheritance squandered, but kind of like film school tuition paid for by my aunt. The shooting of Tales from the Gimli Hospital began in May of 1986. I couldn't tell from these post-it notes how long the movie was supposed to be. I sort of assumed it was going to be about 20 minutes long. And so I just started filming it without making up a schedule or anything. I, I um, didn't like to inconvenience the actors much, so I tried to film them separately as much as possible. Progressively, as we went along, he would add shots and, you know, and say, well, I just need to come back for an another shot of you sleeping, and then we're absolutely done. I always felt I was half done the movie. After that first day of shooting, I'd done all the close-ups of the main actor, after all, and uh, I thought I was really doing quite well because it only took me an hour to do them. Six weeks later, he said, you know what, I just need one more sleeping shot and then we'll be finished. And I'm like, okay. And, and he did that about eight or nine times, coming back for various nap shots and that kind of stuff. Had anyone actually been able to show me just how far away from the finish line I was at any point, I probably would have just quit. What started as a little short film uh, took about a year and a half for, for shooting to be completed, and it ended up being Tales from the Gimli Hospital. Every now and then I'd wake up in the middle of the night and on my walk to the bathroom would see or think of something that had happened earlier in the day or, or make an odd sort of dreamy connection um, with something I'd just dreamt of to something in the story and would decide to include it. And so the movie got detailed very slowly that way, and then I would shoot it next time I had enough money. The idea of giving Kyle a fish gut shampoo or whatever would occur to me, and so I'd add it. The film's crew consisted of Madden and McCullough. My duties ranged from working as an actor to moving the lights to, um, you know, making props to, you know, making uh, suggestions on story ideas. Guy would do the camera and all the lights. Kyle would do makeup on anybody who came in. Makeup was really simple. I mean, that's the beauty of black and white and, and the single light. It's, uh, you know, it was mortician's wax and a little bit of mascara in the crevice. Mortician's wax is impossible to remove from chest hair and back hair and leg hair. It's awful. Won't shower off or anything. It was an odd feeling having mortician's wax being poured on your body, but that was the film. I read up on filmmaking. I read the, about the basic three light setup, the key light, the back light, the fill light. And uh, whenever I set up those three lights, I just had a subject with three nose shadows. And so I would unplug two of them until uh, I just had one nose shadow and then move the light until the nose shadow was at least a flattering nose shadow. There was nothing tricky about it. Guy Madden had a Bolex in one hand on a tripod and a light in the other. And he'd move the light around until he got the effect he wanted. And then I would have really harsh, dark shadows and basically expressionist or noir lighting. You can really create great drama if you understand light and shadow. And he used to always say that you know, it's, it's his cheapest prop. Plus, there's always the old Vaseline on the lens trick. <laughs> Goop it up really good and it refracts the light in God knows how many ways. Guys, you know, as he always says, he and a jar of Vaseline are never very far apart. I started getting things that looked at least atmospheric to me, and a lot of the films that uh, John Pays and I looked down our noses at uh, at the Winnipeg Film Group seemed to lack atmosphere, and we thought we were at least ahead of the game if we had atmosphere. Almost everything that we understand as the the norm for, for film production, I think, just bites at Guy's temperament and makes him um, agitated. The techniques with which I made the movies had to be different from what I'd witnessed on sets in Winnipeg and other movie sets. Just 
watching MOWs being made and things with, with inevitably disappointing results. I decided that I would just try making my, with my own system, and if I failed, well, at least I would have failed in a slightly different way. Guy loved the notion of making movies on what I would call a leisurely gentleman schedule. Lazy is the word that comes to mind. They would shoot, you know, for 10 minutes on a given day, and then they'd have a couple of beers and watch TV. Without that kind of schedule, I don't think Guy could ever have gotten his legs as, as a director. Uh, he needed that. There's lots to be said for making a movie that way when you're very inexperienced. When uh, fate deals you all sorts of um, sucker punches, when scenes come back looking like night instead of day, like happened to me, I just started slowly turning the narrative dial to nocturnal for the, the whole movie, just to sort of roll with the punches that were thrown my way by bad luck and, and poor technical expertise. The shooting of Tales from the Gimli Hospital continued through 1986 and into the spring and summer of 1987. He'd figured out after making one film that so many shots in the film could be f done anywhere in your bathroom. There was a scene uh, where um, uh, three characters are in a boat going across Lake Winnipeg. Schnofrieder is being cradled by Gunnar, and then there's a native explorer who's paddling, and we shot that scene in his backyard. So we, we lugged this wooden boat from his neighbor's yard, put it in the backyard, and I thought, well, how are you going to create water? So he, what he did is he just put candles all around the, the rim of the boat, and uh, we positioned the actors, and had Don paddle as if he was in Lake Winnipeg, and uh, just didn't light the grass. He put us in his canoe. She, she felt so alive in my arms, and took us to the cemetery. And once you had the sound effects uh, of the water in, in place, the scene worked great. And I thought, well, that's great. That's, that's independent filmmaking. When I was just walking down the beach in Gimli one day and, just, and saw a boy walking on the, down the beach with a, with a dead seagull, and so I quickly paid him five bucks for it and drove into the city. It's a one-hour drive. I remember one day he came into our office. He said, uh, I have a scene where I have to rub a dead seagull over somebody's stomach. Does anybody want to do it? Dave Barber was the only guy in there, the Cinematheque manager. Uh, so I put the mortician's wax scars on him and turned the camera on. And it was a real dead seagull. And I remember because after Guy did the scene, I rushed into the bathroom and splashed water over my stomach because I thought I'm going to pick up some strange bird disease or something. I s even stored it in a bag in my freezer for a week to make sure the shot turned out OK, and then threw it out a week later. He asked me if I wanted my face to be in the film. I said, oh, no. And so he cut that out. He never asked why I was doing this or anything. And uh, I had another shot. For all of Guy Madden's uh, deliberately affected um, antique quality to the images he presents. He, he also doesn't shy away from deliberate anachronism. He enjoys uh, sort of playing with the audience in that way. He wanted some kind of prop for the kids to have, and uh, we were kind of thinking about what could be a good prop. His mother's lying on her deathbed. Just seemed right to go across the street to the 7-Eleven and get a big gulp. It just came to me that a big gulp might be the best way to say death. I think Guy's cameo in Gimli Hospital is kind of perfect, where he's distracting patients with little little puppet plays while he's amputating their limbs. It seems like a perfect metaphor for a film director anyway, entertaining with one hand, amputating with the other. I decided to be in Gimli Hospital um, just for the usual reasons people want to be in movies, a, a form of vanity. So I grew a little mustache, a pencil-thin mustache, and, and uh, slicked my hair back and played the role of a doctor. But I kept forgetting I was in the movie, and whenever I tried watching the picture, I would always astonish myself by suddenly appearing on the screen, and it always ruined the experience for me. I developed a, 
a numerical system for directing actors because I'm a bottom line kind of person. There was a numbered system, but it, but it, it, it was more about like talking about that numbered system and creating that mood, you know, of like, th like wouldn't it be great if this is the way we worked? And, and I, I'm, I was all for it. I would just use the number one for jealous brooding, number two for dread, and number three for completely repressed joy, uh, that sort of thing. And, and then you start mixing numbers. You do, a, you know, four and a, and a one half of three or something. Angela Heck. She had her own number. She had flirtatious solicitude, which was a 10, because uh, no one else got to get that compli emotionally complicated. And then she had uh, dead, which isn't even a number. If I had a little bit more um, say now, I probably wouldn't have done it quite so big and so stilted. But it was also what was called for under the, under the circumstances, I think. I think Kyle McCullough gives me exactly what I asked of him in every shot, uh, exactly the degree of mannerism that I wanted. The only time we ever fought was when I think we were arguing over a very small fraction. I think it was like four and five sixths or something like that, and I forget which, which sixth offended him the most, but he just snapped something at me and I snapped and stormed off the set and took a pitchfork to um, a plaster statue of a Madonna. My friend Jeff Cilillo, he had this friend named The Rat, and he's a really neat looking guy. When I phoned him and asked him to, to come and very presumptu presumptuously to be in my movie, uh, he just said no, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe he was turning down this part. But I had already sort of scheduled the shoot and everything, and, and I just sort of offhandedly joked uh, with Kyle that he'd have to play both parts. And he said uh, that he would do it in blackface. I had to do a little convincing, but you know, I, I, I said, you know, I can do this, and I really want to do that, so let's let's do it. I laughed, but I just said no way. And uh, Kyle and I spent about an hour discussing this. The the discussion sort of went yes way, no way, yes way, no way, and uh, I finally said, okay, I'll shoot it, knowing I probably wouldn't include it. But I did shoot it, and I, I realized that the the scene really did need something kind of annoying and. I started to think more about the tradition, the minstrel tradition in films, and I realized it kind of belonged in this movie. I didn't want the movie to be seen as just a big love letter to cinema past. I wanted uh, to embrace everything, good and bad. I know the scene is potentially hurtful to people who are coming to it without a film history background. But frankly, those innocent bystanders just tend not to come to see Tales from Gemini Hospital. My favorite sequence is that little color sequence where uh, the mermaids come out of the water. He asked me if I wanted to be the fish princess. It was really, really cold in September and under that dress, I had on like three pairs of wool socks and really big combat boots because that was the only thing that all that socks would fit into because I was freezing. And Guy had his tripod on the roof of his station wagon. I think the most Icelandic part of that movie is the, uh, the glima wrestling. I'd only seen still photographs of traditional Icelandic glima wrestling where men grab each other's buttocks and try to lift each other off. And it was only after making Tales from Gimli Hospital I saw a real demonstration of glima wrestling. And it looks just like uh, it does in, in my picture. It seems made up, but it is a real wrestling form. And it uh, continues to this day. In the summer of 1987, a rough cut of tales from the Gimli Hospital was nearing completion. I, I started editing the movie as I went along. I wasn't doing it because I was really together and organized. I literally was cutting it because I thought, I always thought I was almost finished. Because he really didn't know how to edit a film, it took a long time 
to edit it, but I mean that in a positive way. He just invented his own way of editing. I had an assembly, and the movie kind of clocked in at 40 minutes, much longer than I thought it would be. For some reason, I thought the movie would be 15 or 20 minutes. I can't remember exactly. I almost said, well, you know, I've pretty much finished the film. Um, do you mind coming up to the edit suite uh, and taking a look at it? I showed him a 40-minute cut, and he was actually quite uh, positive about it. I remember at the time just thinking, like, holy cow, this is, like, amazing. I've, like, never seen anything like this. And he encouraged me to go back and shoot more to make it a feature. You know, 50, 45, 50 minutes, that's kind of a weird length for a movie. You know, why don't you just go, like, I don't know, whatever, just go shoot more stuff so that it's, like, feature length. But I felt it was very tight the way it was. But when they just started saying, why don't you add more scenes, I was kind of insulted. Then I suddenly realized that Icelanders like to tell stories, that the sagas and all the stories I heard growing up at home um, would allow for me to add some stories within the story, and then perhaps some stories within the stories within the stories. I think I feel a story coming on. George suggested a couple of them the three little girls going into the woods and coming back from the river. It's a tiny little inner story that always fascinated me, and, and Hans Christian Andersen's The Snow Queen, and I felt that uh, a little sprinkling of Andersen might be a nice fairy tale feature of the Gimli world. One day they strayed deeply into the woods, too deeply, I fear, for it was a hungry summer. And the weeks passed with neither the scent nor the song of the little girls. Then came gliding down the river three tiny wooden coffins. Reposed within were the sisters, still together, drifting. Were they dead? Or were they merely sleeping in the quiet boxes borne along by the water of the sad Icelandic river? Kyle McCullough had done this lengthy thing in blackface, and it was wildly politically incorrect. And I think I was the one who kept pointing out to go, you can't put this in the film, people boo you out of the theater. He said, you'll be killed. Never show this. You know, it's very offensive. It's awful. You're a fool. You're a jerk, you know? And these are all the things I sort of thought. And the last thing in the world I, I wanted to ever do was hurt anybody or be hurtful. He refused to take it out of the film, but he said that what he would do is he, he would have a sad funeral for the blackface character, and that's where he got Greg to get into the film with a torch. As a child, I was a baseball fan out here at the lake, used to listen to Minnesota Twins games on the radio, and you could never quite get the station quite properly. And so neighboring pop stations uh, would overlap the baseball broadcast. It would be really hard to hear those games, and, and, and you'd just be hearing a lot of I kind of liked this enveloping and this burying, as if my beloved Minnesota Twins were being tucked in, almost. He has this amazing loop that he developed during Gimli Hospital, maybe even a little earlier on Dead Father, but he, had this, he has this loop of optical hiss um, that he kept making murkier and hissier as the years uh, progressed. When the needle would get to the end of a record and it would just like keep going back and forth, like he had like a whole loop of that and he put tons of that on the soundtrack. I took public domain recordings of things and, um, and usually tried slowing them down, playing them on this turntable my brother made when he was 15 um, that had a great 16 RPM uh, capacity on it so I could uh, slow things right down and sometimes slow them down even more by putting a thumb 
on them. And so I could take a peppy foxtrot or something from the 1920s and, and turn it into a dirge. It felt kind of fun to invent my own way. I recall that Gimli Hospital has some of the longest credits that I've ever seen in a film, and I think that was partially to bring it to the 72-minute level. Most of the credits are made-up credits. A move that I sorely regretted when I traveled with the picture to film festivals because the credits just move so, so slowly. Everyone always waits around for the lights to come on after the credits and a Q&A, and at most movies they wait anyway, but during Gimli Hospital, they usually give up. Steve Snyder got a producer credit because I was really broke one day and um, having spent all my money on the movie, I guess, and he bought me a couple of hamburgers. I said, come on, I'll buy you lunch. Give me a credit in the film, which we thought was very funny at the time, so he decided to make me the producer. I guess I have to take, from Guy's vantage point, the blame for the film being called Tales from the Gimli Hospital. It wasn't until I was ready to complete the movie that George Tolls asked me, hey, you know, you're not really going to use the title Gimli Saga, are you? And he had a title that he wanted, and he was thinking, yeah, but George really hates it, and I, I have to listen to George. And I put a lot of stock into George's opinion, and, and he kind of liked Tales from the Gimli Hospital. The guy would still change the title back if there was any way to do it. Extra Large Productions is a company uh, John Harvey and I formed um, to make movies in Lockport, Manitoba. One night, Guy phoned me up and said, uh, I had this idea for an opening title card. It started with Jumbo Productions, and it would have this boat as a logo with, you know, the boat horn tooting. He said, I, I, I see this ship coming through uh, living room curtains. So I thought, well, that's a great, that's a great image. We decided to seal the deal with pizzas at, um, at the Gimli Pizza Parlor. Uh, with a jumbo pizza, and they said, no, we only have extra large. Um, that's as big as we have. And, and we looked at each other and we realized that we'd have to actually change the name of our company in order to seal the deal properly. The title card ended up... shooting began on Tales from the Gimli Hospital, the film was finally completed. Eventually, you know, it was sort of obvious that if the film was going to have any sort of theatrical life, um, you know, 16 millimeter print wasn't going to cut it, so we would need a 35 millimeter print, and, you know, blowing up the 16 to 35, even, you know, in like 1988, 89, was a pretty expensive proposition, so we didn't really have a lot of money for that. Uh, well, we had no money for that. But also, uh, it was like, well, how are we going to get this film out into the world. Greg was working at the film group uh, as a distributor, and um, I think he really, he championed the film uh, and um, really, really worked hard to get the film out there and noticed and, and shown. I thought, gee, it would be great to also have marketing materials and stuff like that. It'd be great to have like a really cool poster. It'd be really great to have like proper stills. It'd be great to have little sales one sheets. It'd be great to have all kinds of, you know, maybe even some really cool t-shirts and just stuff to like sell the film with. Greg wanted to have a, a real Hollywood style movie poster. I had an idea for the poster. I had this idea of a love triangle and we found out the exact dimensions of a real Hollywood movie poster and then got to work. There were ad slicks that he put together. There was a excellent theatrical quality poster, excellent stills. I have to admit, this was the late 80s. And you know what? There was a lot of cultural funding in the late 80s available, a lot of it. And I think um, no stone was left unturned in my search for money. The marketing budget for Tales from the Gimli Hospital um, exceeded the actual production budget of the film. The budget for the movie was $22,000, I think. Um, I didn't really keep track of the bills that much. And the marketing budget was well over $40,000. Well, Greg Klimke made up this great press kit for the movie, and 
A lot of times, people when reviewing the movie would say they really liked the press kit a lot more than the movie. With high hopes, Madden and Klimq arranged for the world premiere at the Winnipeg Film Group's Cinematheque, where a sold-out crowd became the first audience to experience a Guy Madden feature film. If Guy has a recurring nightmare about audience reception for anything that he's done, I'm sure that the audience the first night of Gimli Hospital has a prominent role in that nightmare. I don't know what I was expecting. I think I expected people to really be tuned into what I was trying to do, and clearly everyone was bored. It was a dispiriting occasion. There was, um, there was little audible response to the movie. No one laughed at anything that I thought might be funny. People were getting up and going to the bathroom with sort of medically alarming frequency. And the door at the Cinematheque, I think it's still unchanged. It sort of opens and closes in a series of clicks, squeaks, big beams of light, <laughs> um, um, slower creaks, and then louder ka-chunks and clicks. And, then, and so the movie was just scored with the, this, this sound of the door opening and closing. And then at the reception upstairs, everyone avoided me as if I were a serial killer or as if maybe I'd just had my family slaughtered. I could see that Guy was um, trying to put a good face on things, but that he was um, writhing. I remember holding a grudge about that evening for a long time and vowing I'd never premiere another movie there and things like that. But. Um... You know, I was full of myself quite a bit. Like many first-time Canadian features, Gimli went on to find its audience on the film festival circuit. Despite being accepted by the Montreal and Vancouver film festivals, no letter of acceptance had arrived from Toronto. I was um, working for the festival when I first saw Tales of Gimli Hospital, and we were very, very aware of Guy Madden because we had shown his wonderful short film, The Dead Father, um, at our festival a couple of years prior to that. I was expecting to go back uh, to the Toronto Film Festival of Tales of Gimli Hospital because I had been just there the year before with the dead father and I thought that they'd be um, on to it, you know, big sophisticated city. We saw it, we kind of looked at it, we were a bit mystified by it and we were looking at a lot of films at that point in time. And then we came back to it when we were making our decisions and we had endless discussions about it actually before we made a decision. Jeff Pavier, who's always been supportive of me, was one of the three jurors and he kept supplying leaks to Greg Clem Q about what was going on in the debate. He was basically initially hinting pretty strongly that he was having troubles with other people on the selection committee that, and they just weren't grooving on the film. They weren't really getting it. It's funny, there was, I mean, there were three people on the committee, I won't name names. There was one person who felt much more strongly about it than the other two. Piers Handling and Kay Armitage didn't like the movie and Jeff did and he was outnumbered. There had even been some talk about the amateurish sound. Um. The problem with that is programmers in the Toronto Film Festival don't have good record collections. They don't have record collections at all. I felt that the sound was was extraordinary. I mean, and evocative for me in the best way. Eventually, um, Jeff called up. He said, you know, Greg, I'm really sorry. I, the film will not play at the Toronto Film Festival. We were very aware that we were turning down uh, a first feature film by a young Canadian filmmaker that we wanted to support. In hindsight, it was probably a mistake. We, of course, set ourselves up as being the, the most important showcase of new Canadian cinema in the world, and uh, we had missed this, this wonderful film. Somehow, it, it, rather than discouraging me, it just convinced me even more that the movie was worthwhile, something to this day I'm not entirely convinced of. Well, I still went to the Toronto Film Festival, even though the film wasn't in the festival. The producer kind of famously uh, went to the Toronto Film Festival anyways and screened it in hotel rooms to distributors and anybody who would listen. There was this big buzz for this crazy Canadian film that wasn't even in the Toronto Film Festival. In Film Comment magazine, four months after the Toronto Film Festival, an article on the Toronto Film Festival would appear, but at least half the article was about Gimli Hospital, and I felt really good about that. And that sort of started to happen more and more. The film festivals that it appeared at, that it was a film about which people wrote the most. Eventually, at one point, a uh, Canadian distributor by the name of Andre Bennett was at Montreal. He took a look at the film. He really loved the film. I went running out afterwards to look for the filmmaker, Guy Madden. We got together, we had lunch or dinner on the rich. 
had a few drinks, talked about the film, and I said, listen, I really want to distribute this film. So by the end of the evening, I was distributing the film. We got some money, and, um, and all of a sudden, it felt like, yeah, I was right. It, it is okay, you know? It's, it's, someone will like it. Tales would eventually be brought to the attention of cult film impresario Ben Barinholtz who ran New York's legendary Quad Theater. Any oddball film shown in the country, I would get a call and say, just your kind of film. And I was sort of impressed with the kind of filmmaking. I think it was out of his mind. It ended up getting distribution and playing in New York for, you know, over a year at the Village Cinema. The fact that it had this endless run in New York City was something that no one could have foreseen. Gimli was more successful in the United States than it was in Canada. We worked the pay and working campaign for the release in the United States, and we decided to release the film only at midnight, trying to make a cult film out of it. People were fascinated. What is this film? I had to go midnight to go see it, and they would go. I should have done the same thing in Canada. I think it was that New York run uh, that made people sit up and take notice. His star has risen over the years, eh, because he's just continued to make these, these strange films. Since Tales from the Gimli Hospital, Madden's style has remained remarkably consistent, but his films have become more accomplished. He collaborated again with McCullough and Klimkue on the features Archangel and Careful, both earning critical acclaim, including an award from the U.S. National Society of Film Critics as we, Best Experimental Film awesome. for Archangel. Blood. In 1999, Madden reunited with Heck and Gottlieb for the short film Hospital Fragment, an impressionistic series of images inspired by tales from the Gimli Hospital. Madden continues to fly under the radar of most Canadians, despite winning a Genie Award with his remarkable short film The Heart of the World and garnering critical raves for his latest feature, The Saddest Music in the World, which won three Genie Awards. If you're sad and like beer, I'm your lady.